All right, everybody, we are back for section 5.2. We're going to talk a little bit more about policing. Um, and last time we left off with the federal law enforcement, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about state and local police, okay? Um, every state has at least one uh, state police agency, um, but they all have different names, right? Um, so in Texas, the main state police, police agency was the Department of Public Safety, right? Um, uh, some states they're called the state patrol or the highway patrol or the state police or the state bureau of investigation or whatever. Um, each state has kind of their own naming system and states can have more than one, right? So being from Texas, we're all very, very proud of our Texas Rangers. Um, there is a still to this day, a law enforcement agency in the state of Texas. They're a state police agency called the Texas Rangers. Um, they're a very, very small group, very, very exclusive they, you know, for every opening, they have huge, crazy hundreds and thousands of applicants. Um, but yeah, they're, so they're all, every state has at least one. Most states have multiple and they all are called different things, right? Um, when you get down to the local level, usually counties will have sheriff's departments, right? And they're in most states, again, this is going to vary state by state and even county by county, but in most states, um, kind of the city police, um, their job is to do the police function within the city limits. The sheriff's department is there to do the policing function outside of the city limits, but within the, the rest of the county, right? Um, and the sheriff, um, as I discussed uh, in a previous video, um, they come from the old English Shire Reeve, right? So this is kind of the oldest still functional law enforcement uh, position, although the, the job is completely different today than it was, you know, 500 or 1,000 years ago. Um, also, interestingly, in the United States, sheriffs are often elected, right? You go to the voting booth and you get to say, this is the person I want to be my sheriff, which is really, really weird. I mean, no other law enforcement position gets to be elected, right? Um, for city police, usually the, the chief of police is um, appointed by the either the city council or the mayor or something. Um, state police leaders are appointed by the governor. Federal police leaders are appointed by the president, right? But the sheriff is actually elected, which is, is weird but interesting, right? Um, so the sheriff is outside the city limits. The city police is inside the city limits. The city police is is kind of the most common form of policing. It's the most visible. It's the one that all most of the movies and TV shows are about. You know, they're the ones wearing the the blue uniforms uh, with the little badge and and you know, there's my little Lego police dude. So he's got his little badge. He's got his handcuffs, right? He's got his his, his belt with all his stuff and his little radio and got a little police on the back there. It's hard to focus on something that small. Might I don't have the best webcam. Um, but, you know, the boys in blue, right? That's the city police. Um, and that is kind of the vast majority of the day-to-day -day functional policing is done by uh, those guys. Um, in addition, for local police, they have... Um, sometimes they will have special police agencies that aren't county police or city police. Um, sometimes... They're completely separate police agencies than those, um, but they do similar jobs, but for special purposes, right? So in New York, they have the Transport Authority Police, and they're completely different than the NYPD. They're a completely different agency with a different mission, but they are local law enforcement, right? Um, and their job as the Transportation Authority, they're the police for the subway system and the ferry system and, and all that kind of you know, um, um, in that geographic jurisdiction, right? Um, but they work alongside the city police to police those areas, but they have that kind of specialized role, right? Um, if you're living in a place with a large seaport, they might have a special seaport police. Um, other times, you know, uh, a state might have a special um, you know, if, if, especially if it's out west somewhere, they might have a special, like, um, uh, 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 wilderness police, right, to investigate kind of environmental crimes and hunting and fishing violations and things like that. Um, obviously, the federal government has that, 
um, but a lot of states do as well. If this, and you know, the kind of the more wild areas they have, the more a state is likely to have that kind of special police, very focused uh, on one specific geographic area or one specific mission or one specific crime, that kind of thing. Um, and each of these different agencies have different jurisdictions, right? And again, we're talking not just geographic jurisdiction, right? So they do have different geographic jurisdictions, like the city police, their jurisdiction is within the city limits. Um, a sheriff's jurisdiction is within that county. Um, a state police agency's, their geographic jurisdiction is within that, within the state borders. Um, but they also have uh, jurisdiction based on what crime was committed, you know, so if it's a um, uh, 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 somebody shot an, an, an endangered owl, um, it's going to be, if the state or, or county has it, it's going to be the jurisdiction of their, you know, whatever their hunting and fishing regulation um, law enforcement agency is, right? If somebody gets mugged on a subway in New York City, the jurisdiction is for the transportation authority rather than the normal NYPD. Um, so, e it, it can get really complicated to determine who has jurisdiction based on the geography, the crime, the offender, the victim, all these things come into play to determine who gets jurisdiction um, and whose job it is to investigate and, and you know, uh, arrest and all those things. All these agencies are made up of uh, both sworn and unsworn or non-sworn personnel. And essentially the difference is, if you're talking about sworn personnel, you're talking about the keep people who carry a badge and a gun, right? Um, and those are the ones we think of when we think of people who work for, um, whether we're talking federal, state, or local, any kind of police agency, um, we talk about the people who work for them, we're thinking about the sworn people, right? But the non-sworn people can be just as important, just as, as much of a... a, a, a uh, uh, help uh, with that policing function, right? Um, so um, at police agencies I've seen, they might have uh, non-sworn personnel working in the lab, right? Whether it's a DNA lab or a, a digital forensics lab or a fingerprint lab or whatever, a lot of those people are probably going to be non-sworn personnel. They don't carry a badge and a gun, but they work for whatever agency we're talking about um, working for that police function. Um, and it's also everything from, you know, the janitor to the administrative assistants to, you know, the people who work in the lab to the HR department to the, you know, all these different positions that have to come together in order for that police department to do uh, a job, do that job of policing whatever area, whatever jurisdiction we're talking about at whatever level. Um, and a lot of times the non-sworn personnel will outnumber the sworn personnel um, because there's so much behind the scenes work that has to get done um, before, before anybody can be arrested so, you know, so that police agency can run smoothly. <clears throat> so law enforcement education. Um, you know, way back in the day, uh, 19th, early 20th century, po uh, police department jobs, law enforcement jobs were... Um, given out by whoever won the local election, right? So there were a lot of corrupt areas where, um, you know, somebody would be running for mayor or governor or whatever, and they would go up to the kind of, you know, the, the not so savory people in the area and be like, look, if you help get me elected, you provide for me, you know, this number of votes, I will provide for you this other number of jobs, right? So the bad guys would get their, you know, the people who lived in their area to vote for that person for mayor, or governor, or whatever. And the mayor or governor would say, okay, you can have a hundred policing jobs and a hundred of this job and a hundred of that job. And the bad guys would say, okay, who wants a job? Who's willing to pay me? Right. Um, and then they would give out those jobs to the people they wanted. And those were the new police officers. Right. And they would get handed a badge and a nightstick and say, make sure that you know, your little geographic area is, you know, two blocks by three blocks and make sure that there's no crime in that area. Do whatever you need to do. And they would go in and they'd bust heads and they'd, you know, do all kinds of stuff. Um, but now, policing is seen as much more of a professional um, group, a professional job. So we need to make sure that people have an education. And the vast majority of the country, you need at least a high school education, 
right? You need to have at least a high school diploma. More and more and more, police agencies are requiring either some number of college credits or a college degree, right? Especially for federal law enforcement. I'm, I don't think any there's any federal law enforcement where you can get a sworn, you know, badge and gun job without a college degree. Um, but even state and local police agencies now are more and more requiring, you know, at least some college, if not a full degree. Um, but the good news is there's lots of different ways to get um, that education and different ways to um, uh, pay for it, right? So the LEAA um, is the law enforcement academic, in the, I don't know, it doesn't matter what the thing stands for. Um, they are in charge of, of trying to make sure that uh, police officers are trained um, and educated uh, in different ways, right? So there's everything from the pre-law enforcement career, you know, high school and college stuff. Um, but then there's also, once you get hired, there's a whole bunch more education and training you have to go through. Like getting a degree in criminal justice or a high school diploma or whatever is not the end of it. You need so much more training. Um, and the LEAA is what is there to help um, facilitate that training. Each state agency, each state usually has a group or, or an agency or whatever that also does the same thing just for that state, right? So T-Close, which is listed there, is the Texas-specific uh, law enforcement training education agency, right? So if you're a Texas police officer, um, you get to go to them to, to get different kinds of training and they might um, send you to a place or tell you where you can go to get that kind of training or you even help pay for it, right? Um, but every police officer um, everywhere in the country, once you start, right, you're hired off the street, you've got your high school diploma or your college education, whatever, um, you have to go through the police academy. And this is kind of the equivalent of military basic training. This is where you learn the very, very, very bare minimum stuff, right? Um, how to salute, how to wear a uniform, how to drive the car, how to, you know, what the basic laws are, what are you allowed to do, what are you not allowed to do, all this stuff, right? Um, the police academy usually lasts at least a couple of months. It, it depends, again, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, what kind of job you're talking about. Are you going to be, you know, a rural area sheriff or are you going into the FBI? It's going to depend, the, whatever the academy is, is going to be vastly different um, depending on kind of what job you're going to go. But it's usually at least a couple of months. Um, once you're done with the police academy, though, you still have more training to do. Um, there's usually, almost always, some kind of field training, right? So you've graduated the academy, you're a rookie police officer, or FBI agent, or whatever, um, and they will usually shove you with a field training officer, or an FTO, right? And for the next few months, or even up to a year, you ride along with that field training officer and essentially you have a more experienced person there who, and they were specially trained on how to train young officers and you get field experience. You get, you know, act, you go to actual crimes, actual calls, and you get to see how things are done from this field training officer and learn from them about how things actually happen in the real world on the streets, essentially, right? Um, but even then you're not done, right? So different states, different jurisdictions have different requirements for continuing education. Meaning you have to keep going to classes at least once a year, or twice a year, three times a year, whatever. You have to keep, you know, every once or twice a year you have to go to um, a shooting range and re-qualify with your service weapon, right? Whether you're carrying a revolver or an automatic or whatever, um, at least once a year you have to go back and and you know, kind of prove to the agency or somebody hired by the agency that you know how to use your, your service weapon. Um, you can go to different uh, advanced training, continuing education on hostage negotiations or digital forensics or SWAT tactics or you know, there's all kinds of different things. Um, but different agencies, different levels, different jobs require different levels of this continuing education. But any level, any job requires at least some of it. Right? You don't get to stop training. You don't get to stop learning. You don't get, ever get to stop knowing more, doing more, or maintaining those old skills or anything. As long as you're employed, you have to continue some kind of education at some level at some rate. Okay. 
And then a lot of times there's specialized training for promotion, right? So let's say I'm going from a patrol officer to a sergeant, or I'm going from a sergeant to a detective, or I'm going up to, you know, into the command ranks. I'm going to be a lieutenant or a captain or something. Um, those will very often have some kind of special training for that promotion, right? Um, so if you're going into the command ranks, you need to learn how to do an HR spreadsheet. You need to learn how to run a schedule. You need to learn how to, you know, do all these different things that only those in the command rank need to know how to do, right? So a lot of times it'll be like, hey, you're being promoted to lieutenant. Now go off for two weeks or a month of this special class on how to be a lieutenant, right? Um, so there's all kinds of different education and training and learning and developing and maintaining skills, and it's just constant. You never, ever, ever, ever get to get out of it until you retire. And even then, you shouldn't. You should maintain and, and continue to, to do those things, but you don't have to anymore once you retire. But as long as you're employed in any kind of law enforcement job, um, you're always going to be reading and learning and doing and listening and training and all those things. Um, so, you know, get used to it. Uh, law enforcement careers. What makes law enforcement careers different? What makes them interesting? What makes a lot of people really enjoy them? Um, well, first, the downside, right? Um, law enforcement careers are often very... A lot of people don't like them because of things like shift work, right? Um, and different law enforcement agencies will do this in a different way. But essentially, police need to be on, on duty 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Somebody at that police department needs to be on duty 24-7 through Thanksgiving and Christmas, through hurricanes, through you know all these different natural disasters and riots and anything that might come up. There has to be somebody working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And different agencies will staff and, and, and get people in at different times of day and different days of the week and different holidays and stuff um, in different ways, right? So some police agencies might um, say, okay, we are going to hire you. Your entire job is working nights. And as long as you stay in this job, you will only work from, you know, midnight to 8 a.m. or whatever. Um, and you are only working nights. Other agencies might do um, rotating shifts, right? So look, for three months, you're working nights. Then three months, you're working days. Then three months, you're working evenings. Then you're back to nights, right? Um, so it shifts every few months or every one month or every you know, however long, um, and you kind of rotate through. Some people go forward, some people go backwards, right? So you go from days to nights to evenings to days. Um, some people go forward from days to evenings to nights to day, you know. Um, and that shift work, especially if there's a short um, amount of time before you change in the shift, can be very, very damaging to your health, right? Um, like your sleep cycle, it takes about three months for your sleep cycle to catch up with any given change, right? So if you go from days to nights or nights to days, it's going to take your body about three months before it's like, okay, I understand what we're supposed to be doing now. We're supposed to be sleeping at this time, not this other time. Um, but a lot of times, you know, it's every three months you're changing. So as soon as your body gets used to the new shift, oh, it's changed again. Um, and then there are agencies where it's even shorter than three months. Sometimes it's one month. So your body never has a chance to even approach catching up and understanding what that sleep schedule is supposed to be like. Um, some In some police agencies, they do eight-hour shifts, and some they do 12-hour shifts. And some, you know, it's, it's, it's very different in the amount of time you have to work and when you work and whether it's nights or days or weekends or holidays or whatever is going to change. Um, and it gets really, really nuts, um, it, especially around the holidays, right? Um, so some agencies will make you a deal, like if you work Thanksgiving, you can have Christmas off or the other way around. Some, some uh, agencies, like you never get it off, right? So in Savannah, Georgia, um, St. Patrick's Day, nobody in the Savannah Police Department gets that off ever. Every year on St. Patrick's Day, everybody's working. You will never have that day off. Um, and that's 
part of the job, right? I mean, you, you just get used to never having that off. Um, in other areas, um, other holidays might, you know, in New Orleans, I assume, I don't know this for a fact, but in New Orleans, I'm betting uh, Mardi Gras, nobody gets off, right? Everybody has to work for the New Orleans Police Department for Mardi Gras because there's just that high a demand for police officers that they have to bring everybody in. And you might work days, you might work nights or whatever, but you're going to be working during that holiday. Um, and that's very, very stressful. That that um, both the sleeping problems and the never getting time off during these certain times of the year problems and all these things can be very, very stressful. Um, but also there's just the whole uh, danger and stress of the job, right? No matter when you're working. Um, Police officers, not you know, every time they pull a car over, they get stressed out that, oh, is this person I pulled over going to pull out a gun and shoot me? Um, they're, they're constantly under stress from that fear of, I have no idea who I'm pulling over. I have no idea whose house I'm going into on this call. Um, all these things, that danger causes stress. Um, I heard somebody once say, uh, a police officer once told me, every time I meet with somebody, it's almost always the worst day of their life, right? There's a domestic violence situation. There's been a shooting and somebody's dying. There, um, somebody's been assaulted. Somebody's been raped. Somebody's been robbed, right? When police officers deal with people, very often, it is the worst day of their lives. That is incredibly stressful and that takes a toll on police department, police officer psychology. So you have to be prepared for that, A, and B, you have to have good coping mechanisms for that danger, for that stress. Um, everything from therapy, which police departments, almost all large police departments, have some kind of you know psychiatrist or psychologist that's there to help, um, but absolutely every police officer should have routine meetings with psychologists or psychiatrists. Um, but also things like hobbies, right? Um, find a hobby. I don't care if it's, you know, um, boxing or, or um, shooting or hiking or boating or whatever. Find some hobby that is a good, productive, stress release function, right? It can be anything from reading a book to flying planes, whatever. Um, but all police officers for their psychological health need some kind of stress relieving hobby. But even that's not enough, right? That's that's basic requirement, but it's not enough. They also need regular visits with psychologists or psychiatrists. They need family and friend support. They need some kind of, of um, help. Everybody needs help sometime, right? Um, police officers probably need it more than others. Um, anyway, um, so for law enforcement careers, there's kind of three levels. Um, oh, it's not really levels. It's w different jobs, right? Within any given law enforcement agency, there's three areas where you can work. The first is patrol. Patrol is what we think of. The pol patrol is by far the most common. The, you know, um, if you look at all the city police, uh, officers around the country, the vast majority of them are going to be in patrol, right? This is the biggest, it's the most visible, it's the one we see. It's the one where they're wearing the uniform, um, driving around in the cars and, you know, doing their normal, um, responding to calls, right? Um, they're the first responders, okay? These are the people where if you call 911, they're the ones that show up. Above that, um, or next to that, is investigation, right? So once the first responders have showed up, secure the scene and determine that some crime has commit, been committed, right? Whether it's, you know, a burglary or a robbery or a rape or a murder or whatever. Um, if it needs to go farther, the patrol officer calls in the investigation unit. These are the kind of, you know, the detectives and the, you know, the investigators. And these are the guys that come in, um, not as first responders, but they come in and they take over the scene and they gather the evidence and they analyze the evidence and they question the witnesses and they you know, do all those things and try to find the bad guy, right? They try to figure out who done it. Um, so, you know, there's, if you like that TV show, The First 48, right? That's a TV show on some channel um, where they follow these investigators for murders for 48 hours. 
So at the beginning of the episode, the investigators get called in. There's been a murder. It's it's one of you know it's like cops. It's a it's a documentary kind of reality TV thing. So these cameras follow around these investigators, and they'll show up at a murder scene at the very beginning of the episode, and they'll you know figure out who the deceased is, and they'll figure out you know how he died. Was it a gunshot? Was it a knife? Whatever. Um, is there any evidence on the scene? Is there blood? Is there hair? Is there a footprint? Is there witnesses? Whatever. They question the witnesses, and then. Over the course of an hour-long episode, it follows these investigators over 48 hours to determine if they can kind of figure out who done it within 48 hours, right? Uh, but that's the investigation function. And then, of course, ab above that is the command function. The lieutenants, the captains, the, the chiefs, the assistant chiefs, all those people. And these are the people who do, you know, scheduling and, and, and HR and, you know, the, the really high-profile stuff and the public relations and the, you know, all that kind of administration command uh, kind of things. And these are guys that get paid big bucks. Um, they're much more uh, respected. They're, they get paid more. They get, you know, fancy perks and all this stuff. Um, and while we've done a good job getting uh, women and minorities and stuff into the patrol level, as you go up, the percentage of minorities and the percentage of women and the percentage of any of these marginalized groups gets smaller, right? Um, and that's one of the problems that policing is having to deal with in this early part of the 21st century is how do we make sure that, you know, not only are, are women represented among the patrol officers, but let's make sure they're represented among the command ranks because that's important too. <clears throat> so finally, the last section of, or the last piece of section five, there are four different policing styles okay um and each one is is it can be linked to a a popular movie okay um so the first one is what I, I briefly touched on before where it's kind of the watchman style right um and this is this is like uh the gangs of new york anybody ever see that movie gangs of new york leonardo dicaprio and um a couple other famous people anyway it takes place late 1800s um in new york um, and basically one of the characters is a police officer and he's the kind of guy where he's just some guy from the neighborhood and he got hired on by some, you know, political appointee or political, you know, somebody and he's like, Hey, you want to be a cop? All right. Well, you know, pays good. And they gave him a uniform and a badge and a, and a nightstick and said, you know, make sure that crime doesn't happen. So he kind of ruled that small geographic area with an iron fist, right? People got out of line. He'd whack them over the head with a club, right? I mean, he was very much a... A dictator on the beat right it was it was his job to keep the peace and he would do that by any means necessary and he could do basically whatever he wanted arrest whoever he wanted and hit whoever he wanted and there were no investigators there was no internal affairs there was no oversight it was just as long as nothing became unpeaceful enough to spill out into other areas they left him alone right uh, the second one um, this kind of became famous in the 40s and 50s is the legalistic style. Um, and it was, it was, um, or, or its main theme is like professionalism. We are professionals, right? And this, this is characterized by Dragnet. Anybody ever seen that? There's an old TV show and even a movie in the 80s, uh, called Dragnet, um, where the main character is kind of like, just the facts, ma'am, right? And he wears a suit and he always looks very perfect. And, you know, he doesn't let anybody get away with anything. And if he sees you jaywalking, he's going to give you a ticket because that's the law. And, you know, everything is spick and span. And he investigates and it's by the book. And, you know, everything is exactly the way it should be. And and that is um, a policing style. Did, did our country ever actually live up to that standard? Probably not. Um, but that is a, a kind of goal or a view on how policing should be, right? Then there's the service style, which is essentially very much kind of an us versus them um, style where the police say, we are here to help the people who live in this neighborhood or this community or this small town or whatever, and outsiders are a threat, and we are going to protect our own, and we're going to get rid of those on the outside, and we're going, you know, it is our job to kind of insulate this community from the outsiders who are kind of, by definition, in this case, viewed as the bad guys, right? Um... So if you've ever seen the original Rambo with Sylvester Stallone, right? Um, the movie starts off with John Rambo. He's a Vietnam veteran. He comes back. He's looking for the last surviving member of his old unit from Vietnam. 
and he finds he goes to the guy's house and it turns out he's dead so rambo realizes he's like the last one in this in this elite military unit and he's homeless and so he just he's like depressed and he starts walking and he gets to this town and he gets picked up by a police officer as soon as he walks across, into this town police officer says hey can i give you a ride to the you know the other edge of town and rambo's like yeah sure whatever so he gets in the car and the police officer's like we don't want your kind around here and you know, you're an outsider, and I'll drive you to the edge of town, but then please don't come back, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, drops him off and, you know, kicks him out and is really mean to him. And so Rambo, who's homeless and, you know, this elite military person is like, um, gets really upset at this police officer and decides to kind of go nuts. And so the rest of the movie is about John Rambo kind of, you know, going nuts and doing and breaking all these laws and getting guns and blowing stuff up. And, you know, it's, you know typical action movie but that's very much the service style where the police officer in that movie saw john rambo as this outsider and we need to kind of keep outsiders out um and of course this this style is very much a um can be used and very often was used in a racist way right um so our community is white um, if any, you know, African Americans or Hispanic people, whoever, try to come into our neighborhood, we're going to arrest them or we're going to kick them out or we're going to, you know, um, make them want to leave one way or another. Um, but yeah, that was the service style, us versus them. And then finally, there's community policing, which is the one that's, that's kind of been in vogue the last few years, which is very much a um, let's let's work with the community to determine what they want us to do, how they, you know, what the problems are, and then work with them to figure out how we can fix it together, right? Um, and this started with a broken windows policy and broken windows, um, basically, um, where the name came from, um, if you have a, a building and a window gets broken, if it's repaired quickly, um, it will be a very long time before another window gets broken. You know, a kid will throw a rock through it or whatever. Um, if it's repaired quickly, um, there are very, there are very few windows that get broken. But if a window gets broken and nobody fixes it for a while, all of a sudden, all of the under, other windows are broken very quickly, right? Because people realize that there's no investment in that. Thus, why not break the other windows? Um... So that, that's where the name came from. And the theory basically says, um, if you want to fix the big stuff, the murders, the rapes, the robberies, the car thefts, the arsons, the, you know, all those big things, focus on the little things, right? Um, so enforce littering laws and vandalism laws and vagrancy laws and prostitution laws and drug dealing laws. And if you focus on the little things, the big things will kind of take care of themselves, right? That's essentially the broken windows theory. Um, this kind of sort of worked, but it also had a very big disparate impact on people it probably shouldn't have. And it's, it's very controversial, um, kind of how it was implemented and why it was implemented and all these things. Uh, but then the last bit there is problem oriented policing, which is kind of the latest and greatest of community policing and, and how we really need to work with communities and say, look, what are the problems that you as a community have a problem with? Is it the prostitution that you're having a problem with? Is it vandalism? Is it burglaries? You know, noise violence? What's the... Help us help you. And then the community can come together through a liaison or a, or a group or whatever and say to the police, hey, we would like you to kind of focus on this. This We've noticed that this has kind of been a problem and, and we'd like you to help with that. And the police say, all right, cool. Um, we might not be able to, to do this, but maybe we could do this other thing. Will that work? And... And they work together both as communities or representatives of the community and the police to figure out what the problem is, what the best way to fix it is, and, and kind of how to work together. Make sense? Um, hopefully, uh, in the 21st century, um, all police agencies are at least attempting this problem-oriented policing because it really does result in um, maybe not lower crime, but at least happier citizens, right? Um, sometimes it results in lower crime, sometimes it doesn't, but either way, it makes people happier and makes people believe that they've been listened to and the community, it definitely improves police community relations, which is a good thing in and of itself. Um, but anyway, um, that is the end of section five. 
I will be back with section six. Thank you so much for watching.